as someone who resembles someone else, I appreciate that Liberty Mutual knows everyone's unique. That's why they customize your car insurance, so you only pay for what you need. I mean, just because you look like someone else doesn't mean you eat off the floor <laughs> or yell at the vacuum or need flea medication. Oh, yeah. That's the spot. Only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 Liberty. Listen, we want to say thank you to SoFi Stadium for hosting us today. Yes. This place is so beautiful and so spectacular. But you know what, Monday, we're finally going home. I've been on vacation with you this whole summer. I finally get to sleep in We've my own bed. We've been on vacation bed. together all <laughs> summer long. We've got a new season, guys. We've got a brand new set in the chair. Happening now. 20 years ago, firefighters from around the country, including San Antonio, responded to ground zero after the 9-11 attacks. Today, we talked with some of those men about their memories. Local schools are following different safety guidelines. Coming up, a look at how some schools are responding to contact tracing. And you may be surprised to find out why our sky is extra hazy today. I'm going to talk about that and have a very important tropical update, which affects our rain chances. I'll see you in a bit. The News at 5 starts right now. First at 5, 20 years ago tomorrow, the 9-11 attacks on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center shocking the country. It was the largest terrorist attack on American soil and a pivoted, pivotal moment in our nation's history. It was also unprecedented for the men and women who ran towards the danger and destruction trying to help. Garrett Berger talked to two of those people today. San Antonio firefighters who responded to New York City with the Texas A&M Task Force One and talk about their experience at Ground Zero. Okay. I don't know what what's going on. Everyone remembers where they were on 9-11. For those who saw Ground Zero themselves, those memories are clear too. I can remember just about every night I was up there. Six San Antonio firefighters and an IT member deployed to Ground Zero as part of the Texas A&M Task Force One. The scene they found, incurring horror from the first sight. And as soon as we crested that bridge, you saw a bunch of lights and a ton of smoke, and it just got dead silent on that bus. Never seen anything like that. From September 19th to 27th, the task force members helped to clear rubble and recover remains. So we were working, you know, six foot long torches, cutting steel. We were moving buckets, whatever needed done, we would do. Working in 12 hour shifts around the clock, doing what they could to bring closure to so many grieving families. We're in buses and we're going back and forth to Jacob Javits Convention Center. It's just lined with people in pictures. Help me find my loved one. Meyer says he and other members of the task force brought back pieces of rubble from ground zero but it's not the heaviest things that they carry with them from that time. It's the emotional toll of the experience that truly weighs on them. You know, if I don't think about it, I'm fine. But if I start thinking about it, it starts to get to me. But it's part of them now, and no one will ever need to urge them to remember. Tomorrow morning, I am out of town, but I'm going to be, there's a nearby fire station, and they have a flagpole, and I'm going to be there. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. This morning, Joint Base San Antonio observing the 20-year anniversary of the September 11th attacks. U.S. Air Force personnel at each JBSA military installation taking part in their own remembrance ceremonies. That's just a small part of this morning's ceremony at the grounds of JBSA Lackland. And these are images from simultaneous events held at JBSA Fort Sam Houston and JBSA Randolph. A flag formation, moment of silence, invocation, and a speaker were part of each of those events. The attacks on 9-11 may have been two decades ago, but the impact is still very real today. And students at Piper High School play, paying their respects this morning with a stair climb, a physical way to honor the sacrifice that firefighters made 20 years ago. Together with members of the Bull Verde Fire Department and the community, each step serving as a reminder of all the first responders who lost their lives. Bull Verde Fire Chief Jerry Balick says getting younger generations involved in this way helps them to understand the bravery and the courage that it took responding to the tragedy. 
it's really important that we keep this alive, that we remember what happened on that day, to bring it to these young kids, these high school students, and even my firefighters were probably very young, you know, or if alive when, when, the, when the event happened. Altogether, the climb was 110 stories, the same number all those heroes had to climb 20 years ago. The 20-year war on terror is said to have ended last month after the last of the U.S. with troops withdrew from Afghanistan. But the State Department estimates there's still as many as 100 U.S. citizens remaining in Afghanistan. Today, they say 44 of those citizens were offered a seat on a flight to Qatar. Flights to the U.S. from Qatar and Germany have been halted, though, because of measles, a measles outbreak among Afghans who arrived here. Right now, there's about 40,000 at-risk refugees living on eight U.S. military bases. This picture taken at Fort Bliss. It shows a child holding a piece of artwork. It's one of the first looks we're getting from one of those bases where refugees are being screened. More of them are expected to arrive after they finish their initial screenings overseas. And then later on this month, the Defense Department is expecting to start evaluating how the military will screen and track Afghans in the U.S. Turning now to our coverage of COVID-19, the coronavirus pandemic. When it comes to contact tracing, COVID cases in the classroom, several area school districts are handling things differently. Tiffany Huertas takes a look at one district that says it's an important part of their COVID-19 protocols as she talks with a parent in another district that's taking a different approach. By last Friday, we had received uh, two emails in two days with three confirm positive exposures in his class. Heather Reibel says her son, who attends school in Bernie ISD, quarantined following this news. He went back for the first time in a week today. But Heather is concerned with the school safety protocols. The state reports that as of August 29th, they had a total of 207 COVID cases. Students and staff aren't required to quarantine if exposed to an infected person. And masks are optional. The district emails parents about COVID cases in their child's classroom. They also social distance when possible, use plexiglass dividers, and regularly disinfect areas. We absolutely have to start wearing masks again. At San Antonio ISD, as of August, they've had about 800 total COVID cases. The district's associate superintendent, Tony Thompson, says contact tracing is important. The student tests positive. Um, the nurse, the campus nurse, is going to be the one to you know, first talk to the parent to gather information. We don't identify the positive child by name, you know, for HIPAA reasons, but they still ask them general questions about, you know, um, how closely are your students seated together, um, you know, during the class or in the classroom. Thompson says they rely on cafeteria seating charts in elementary schools and at high schools, they use cameras to help with contact tracing. Tiffany Huertas, KSET 12 News. A federal overreach. It's what more than a dozen U.S. governors are calling President Biden's new coronavirus plan, which largely focuses on getting more people vaccinated. As ABC's Alex Brashe explains, that criticism comes as the CDC releases new studies about the dangers of not getting the shot. President Biden once again making his pitch to the unvaccinated, this time among some of the most at risk, school children. Well, the best way for a parent to protect a child under 12 starts at home. Every parent, every teen sibling, every caregiver around them should be vaccinated. Officials say a quarter of all new COVID cases are among children. Roughly 80 million Americans still haven't gotten the shot. The president rolling out a plan affecting 100 million Americans, ordering all businesses with more than 100 workers to either require their employees to be vaccinated or get tested weekly. That vaccine mandate now also required for 17 million healthcare workers plus 4 million federal government employees and contractors. Biden also focusing on schools. I'm calling on all governors to require vaccination for all teachers and staff. Across the country, nearly 102,000 patients hospitalized. The daily death rate, over 1,000. 
And Friday, the CDC out with three new studies showing being vaccinated still dramatically reduces the risk of being hospitalized or dying of COVID-19 during the rise of this Delta variant. The studies showing vaccines 86 to 87 percent effective against preventing hospitalizations. Those who were unvaccinated were about four and a half times more likely to get COVID-19, over 10 times more likely to be hospitalized and 11 times more likely to die. But opposition to President Biden's plans continue. 19 Republican governors have called his vaccine mandates a federal overreach. And Friday, an appeals court ruled in favor of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis's ban on mask mandates in schools. The state can now continue to punish school officials that have mask mandates without a parent opt out. Alex Perche, ABC News, Washington. Hazy sky today, nothing but sunshine, 95 degrees for the high temperature. But look at our morning, 67. Another refreshing morning below average for this time of year. The average morning low is 71 and we will have one more refreshing morning as we get into tomorrow. Then some noticeable changes. Del Rio now 102 in Warren's backyard. You get to Leon Springs 89, Panamaria 96, 92 in West Kerrville. For the most part, low to mid 90s out there right now. Even Canyon Lake at 92 degrees. Not bad for Friday night football. Hazy sunset, lack of humidity in the air. That's the nice thing. Clear sky, so temperatures falling pretty quickly and not much of a breeze either. So you won't really notice that air movement. We'll talk about why we have so, so much haze out there in a moment, along with tropical moisture and how that affects our rain chances in just a moment. Thank you, Adam. And weather, once again, a factor in a major project on I-10 in Kendall County. Samuel King has more on that. And Samuel, a planned closure at the I-10 and State Highway 46 interchange has been postponed up there in Bernie? Yes, once again, crews are concerned about the potential for rain in the forecast early next week, just like earlier this year when we had those rainy weekends in the spring and summer. Now, crews are going to close the eastbound access road at the State Highway 46 interchange with I-10, as well as the Upper Balconies Road interchange there. The work was to allow crews to shift traffic to a new bridge so the old bridge over I-10 can be torn down. But again, that has been postponed no new date has been set just yet. We will keep you posted. Now here's a look at things uh, in that area on the map right now as we uh, take a look at things here. Actually moved the map a little too early, so we'll just move on. Uh, but again, that project's postponed. But this is happening tonight. Uh, one I-10 westbound, a single lane closure westbound between Ackerman Road and Loop 410. Again, that begins at 9 and that will run throughout the weekend. So if you're on the east side, watch out for that. Also, we have a vehicle fire here. This is uh, the view from 37 and Hackberry. Uh, the smoke has died down. There was a lot of smoke here a little bit earlier, so the crews were able to get out there and get that smoke out. But watch out for delays at I-10 and 37, Tim and Ursula. Thank you, Samuel. For 45 years, Habitat for Humanity has been helping people plant their roots in San Antonio. And this fall, they're going to be doing some more work. Habitat for Humanity kicking off the first day of its fall build with construction on eight affordable homes. They're working toward their overall goal, which is to build 51 homes this year alone. They're going to go to first time home buyers who are all putting in hard work for the place that they'll soon call home. We're starting these houses today and we will be dedicating all of these houses by November 13th and then um, everybody will be in by Christmas. For more information on how Habitat for Humanity works, you can visit HabitatSA.org. All right, summer might be over soon, but the summer night weather is going to stick around and it is perfect for outdoor cooking. If you're tired of the same old, same old, why not try pizza outside? 12 your side puts those portable pizza cookers to the test next. Next. New at five, pizza, specifically Hot, cheesy, gooey, crispy around the edges, charred just right, wood-fired pizza. You hungry now? <laughs> well, you can get that taste at home without spending thousands of dollars on a high-end pizza oven. 12 on your side's Marilyn Mortz checks out portable tabletop pizza ovens to find out if you really can bring your pizzeria to your backyard. 
There's nothing like wood-fired pizza, but at home, portable outdoor pizza ovens claim to rival your favorite pizzeria. Consumer Reports' Paul Hope says it's all about the heat. Portable pizza ovens are everywhere, and they claim to get to really high temperatures that you could never reach in an oven or even most grills. So naturally, we had to take a look. So in his own backyard turned test lab, he tried several tabletop pizza ovens designed to make one 12 to 13 incher. Some use propane, others charcoal, and wood or wood pellets. He made each pizza with store-bought dough, added sauce, and mozzarella. The results all turned out pretty tasty pizza. So what it really comes down to is how easy the oven is to use and whether you prefer gas or charcoal cooking. You want that wood-fired flavor like you'd get from a great pizzeria? You really want one that uses charcoal. Paul found this Uni Karoo to be convenient and sturdy. It has a chimney damper to regulate airflow, important for high heat, but it's pricey at $350. For less money but still good results, he liked this wood and charcoal burning WPPO La Pepe. It comes with a little peephole to check your pies because they bake fast. If you prefer the convenience of gas, CR says consider this Bakerstone Original. And one more thing, there is a learning curve, so you're going to want to practice a lot before you invite company over for pizza. Marilyn Moritz, Case at 12 News. Where do I get the pizza oven testing job? That sounds like <laughs> good fun. <laughs> Serious yeah. work there. All right, taking a live look outside with live cam on this Friday. Little hazy out there, beautiful start to the day. Very warm this afternoon. Not quite as hot as a pizza oven. No, no not, not even close. Those get super hot. And Marilyn mentioned that learning curve. I've used one of those before. There's a steep learning curve, okay? You definitely give it some trial runs before you have anybody over. But they are fun. One more refreshing morning, then the humidity returns. And on Sunday, well, these refreshing mornings come to an end. And we do have some rain chances in the forecast. They're rather complicated. I'm going to explain and talk more about that in one moment. First, let's take a look with our live cam. You see that extra haze in the sky. You probably noticed it just looking up today and even yesterday. Extra hazy sky. That's not dust from Africa. That's actually some activity that's coming in the upper level wind flow from the western U.S. and particularly the Pacific Northwest. Here's our upper level wind pattern. We've got the ridge of high pressure over New Mexico. Clockwise flow around it, as always with the high pressure system here in the northern hemisphere. And that's steering the upper level winds from the western U.S. and the Pacific Northwest right down the plains here into Texas. That steering flow. What's happening in the west? Well, of course, wildfires. So we have all this smoke in the atmosphere indicated by the white and green color. And the upper level steering flow as well, steering that smoke right down here into Texas and San Antonio. Good thing is, is a lot of that will disperse as we get into tomorrow. Look at that by Saturday. You're not going to notice as much of that smoky haze and we won't have the smoky sunrises and sunsets. So by this weekend, it's out of here. But this evening, it's going to be a very red sunset, extra red because of that smoke in the sky. OK, let's talk about our rain chances, our complicated rain chances. We've got this tropical wave right now in the Western Caribbean. It's about to move over the Yucatan Peninsula and emerge into the southern Gulf of Mexico this weekend. This does have the probability of turning into a tropical cyclone. That does not mean it'll be a big hurricane or something. Right now, there are no indications from any of our computer models that we're actually going to have a strong system, you know, a big tropical storm or even a hurricane. No indications of that right now, but development and organization. This is very unorganized right now, but it's likely to pull together and actually become a low pressure system. I mean, we're talking 1008 millibars, so nothing drastic. Bottom line here is this is going to pull that tropical moisture onshore on Sunday. So deep tropical moisture in our atmosphere, and that's going to be around all the way into the early part of next week and most of next week. The big question is here. We have actually several questions. Does it org organize? And if so, how much? because that affects our rainfall chances here. If it's very organized, then it tends to draw that precipitation in closer to the center and keep it in a confined part of Texas, mainly along the coast. Also, if it organizes, what track does it take? Would we be on the dry side or the heavy rain side? Right now, odds would favor. We're kind of in between, but leaning toward the drier side. Here's what our rain chances are now. S Sunday afternoon, 20%. By Monday, 
up to 40%, and then they drop off into the isolated 20 to 30% category by Tuesday of next week. So we really have to monitor that, and once there's organization, we'll have more answers. Dew points, not bad, near 60 degrees, not too muggy. Temperatures, low to mid 90s right now. And by tomorrow morning, another day in the 60s, another morning in the 60s, I should say. The afternoon, though, making it into the mid 90s for most of us. And really a lot of sunshine tomorrow, not too humid. By Sunday, the humidity's back, 92 degrees. And we can't rule out a few of those late day afternoon pop up showers and storms. A lot of uncertainty with the rain chances next week, but we're on top of it and watching that tropical moisture. We'll watch it closely. Thank you. It is Friday, which means big game coverage. Our Greg Simmons is ready for a big one tonight in Somerset. In fact, it is a big game tonight because it's a battle of the early unbeatens. And take a look at this. The game is still about, about two hours away and already fans in the stands because it is parents night. When we come back, a live preview of tonight's big game and our big game coverage between the Cowboys and the Bulldogs. And the Cowboys got close last night and just lost a starter for five games coming up. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome live to Somerset, Texas, for the big game and our big game covers tonight. Number three, Somerset, playing host to McCollum in a battle of the early unbeatens. The Cowboys are coming into this game with a record of 2-0 and after back-to-back -back routes of South San and Navarro out of Austin for a combined 91 points, giving up only 13. That's after they had gone 1-35 over the last four years. For the Somerset Bulldogs, they're also 2-0 and following the upset over Southside 10-6, where they held Nebraska commit Richard Torres to just 163 yards and no touchdowns. You know, a long time since we've won games, but we've worked really hard, and this is going to be good momentum uh, going into playing a good team. You know, after having a rivalry game, a lot of teams take a fall off, but we need to step up and do even better because it's all it's all just for district and making the playoffs. So we can't we can't we can't take any team lightly. All right, here are the matchups tonight. McCullum here in Somerset. Colleen Ellison at Steele and Linhoff. Judson and a and Consolidated travel to Texas State for a neutral field. Lee will take on number five, Johnson at Comalander. Champion Laredo United South in Laredo. Central Catholic against Alamo Heights at Orem. Taft and Holmes, the start of a district game there. Gustafson, MacArthur and Brandeis, the same, a district matchup. Ferris Stadium. How about Sam Houston and Lanier, also a district matchup at SAISD. 7 p.m. Southside travels to Austin, take on St. Michael's. South Sand and Southwest at Dragon. Memorial and Edison at Alamo. Roosevelt and Madison at Heroes. And Tony and Harlandale Memorial Stadium against Harlandale. Burbank versus Kennedy. The Edgewood Veterans and Veterans Memorial against Medina Valley. That is in Casterville. Our big game coverage road trip has Larry and photographer Eddie Latigo headed north tonight with their first stop in Smithson Valley to see the Rangers host El Paso Eastwood. Then it's off to New Braunfels to catch the worst bowl between the Canyon Cougars and, of course, the Unicorns and finally pulling into San Marcos to see if the Riders can give East Central their first loss of the season. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys almost pulled off the upset of the year already in the first game of the season when they took on Tampa Bay last night, but they came up short. And the big reason why? Two missed field goals and one extra point costly. Still, Dak Prescott performed so well. After 11 months off, he came back to throw for over 400 yards. In doing so, this 21-yard touchdown to third quarter to Amari Cooper to get the Cowboys within two points of the defending Super Bowl champs. And Greg Zerline, who struggled all night, gave the Cowboys a lead with this 48-yard field goal, the 129 to play, to make it 29-28 until Ryan the suck up kicked the game winner 36 yard and lift the Bucks to the 31 29 victory. And also, just getting late word, Leo Collins will be suspended for the next five games for violating the NFL substance abuse policy. Don't forget to follow us on BGC app for all the Texas sports live games. Also, follow us on Twitter for the latest scores. And of course, all the highlights on the night beat. Live from Somerset, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. We'll be right back.